welcome and join your blended family. We are so excited today for this episode. Today we're talking about something that we all more than likely have experienced at some level or another in our lives or maybe currently. But today we're talking about anxiety, being anxious. I know no one's ever felt that, right? No one's ever felt anxious or anything. <laughs> but we're really talking about that and trying to shed light, especially in blended families. We know that we have added challenges that can come our way, different struggles, which can lead to more anxiety. And when we're feeling anxious, when we're just not knowing how to handle or navigate through that, then it's harder to navigate and handle our family as well, or to be our best selves. So we're so excited today. We have Dr. Tracy Marks here with us to be able to help shed some light on this, maybe give us some tools and techniques, but she is a board certified psychiatrist of over 20 years. Wow. She is a big YouTube influencer and she is also the author of her now new, just came out hot off the press, Why Am I So Anxious? Powerful tools for recognizing anxiety and restoring peace. So we are completely honored that you are here with us, Dr. Tracy. Thank you for being here. How are you today? I am great. I'm excited to be talking to you all as well. Yeah, we know that you're just going to bring so much value. Like we have lived through parenting, especially in our blended family, parenting our kids who have all struggled with anxiety and still do. Um, the majority of, of our kids still struggle with that now. And so when I came across your book and I saw this title and just the more conversations I have with parents out there, this is something that is so common. And so although we've lived through it, we don't have the, the knowledge like you have, like you, this book is so filled with information, not only to help like teach like where is all this coming from but then like what can we do like what can we do to help ourselves if it's us that's struggling or help our kids that are going through it so um we have some questions just to really dig into that here in just a minute but before we get into all of that we like to just know a little bit of you personally like what is your family dynamics married kids where do you call home and all of that stuff sure so i am married i have a I, I say one and a half children <laughs> because <laughs> I have a son who is a teen who is in high school now, but I also have a godson who we uh, raised during his high school years and he's now out of college, uh -huh. um, but he, I consider him part of our family as well. And, uh, and I have a dog Barney who's <laughs> uh, <laughs> at my feet, sleeping and listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, let's see, I call home, I call, actually I'm a native Floridian and it's hard for me to separate from calling that home, but okay. I've been in Georgia and the Atlanta area now for over 20 years. So that's really home now. Um, and I guess that's about that. <laughs> well, that we love that area. We love Florida and I, I can see where it'd be hard to separate Florida from Georgia because Florida just has some beautiful beaches. <laughs> so we love it that. It does. <laughs> but it does. We're so excited to have you here. Like, like I said, this is really a topic that we love what you're doing because you are taking something that hadn't been talked about for so many years and really helping to shed light on it to make, not to normalize it in a sense, but to. Uh, help anyone that's struggling with it to know, hey, I don't have to hide this or I'm not alone, that I, I can deal with this. I can cope. There are ways that I can get help or be able to overcome this so that yeah. I can be my best self for me and be my best self for my family. So really love what you're doing. Love this book, though. So what, kind of leading into that, what, what caused you to write this book? So I'd always had a desire to teach people and, and educate people on mental health topics. So it started way back, probably in the early 2000s with my, with my, um, a blog on my website. Then I created a podcast. Interestingly enough, it was, um, for working moms. Oh, okay. Um, and I made it for working moms because I didn't think people really wanted to talk about mental health topics. Mm -hmm. So I was just trying to kind of light touch it and call it 
you know, um, avoiding burnout. Mm. Then I started on YouTube um, and really got going with it in 2018. So once I kind of felt free to talk about hardcore, if you will, uh, mental health topics like depression and anxiety and bipolar disorder and like these kind of things, I saw where there was a need to consolidate the information all in one place. So instead of searching 50 videos of mine um, for little nuggets of information to have it be more comprehensive, um, I did have a publisher reach out to me to prompt me to write this. So that's actually what kind of <laughs> <laughs> kind of stirred it a little bit. <laughs> that stirred it because uh, otherwise it was just kind of a thought in my head. But um, but I definitely saw the need. And once I had the the avenue to get it going, then it just flowed for me. Yeah. Man, well, I, I really want us to take this today, like from the the stages, because I like you were saying, you have all these videos and they're a mom. I'm just thinking of like as a mom and searching and trying to find help for myself or for my spouse or for my kids. And I'm looking and I'm trying to find all this information that I could get because we're starting to see like some of those beginning signs or you're starting to hear your kids because I think the vocabulary is out there so much now um, especially with teenagers and social media and the stuff that that they are hearing all of I feel like all of my nieces nephews teenagers that we've worked with in the youth group they use the word anxiety all the time so the word I think is out there a lot and as someone that's looking for help, how do we know the difference of like, what is just regular anxiety that we deal with? Because, you know, that's how our bodies were created versus something that's like, okay, this is a problem and we need to do something about it. Probably the best, the best way to tell the difference is um, normal anxiety is reactionary, usually reaction to some kind of stressful event. And is your reaction in proportion to the event? So for example, you have a test coming up, you're nervous about the test, um, and you, you know, you're you're worried you may not pass, et cetera. That's a normal reaction. The stressor is the test. Once the test, once you take the test, how well do you recover? Before you even take the test, how how well do you manage? the nervousness that you have about taking the test. Um, and then once you have it, does it pass? For someone who without an anxiety disorder, they can have this experience of being presented with something that, that causes distress for them, be able to cope with it and still function, get through that stressor, whatever it is, and then recover and move on to the next thing. The person for whom they either have an anxiety disorder or the anxiety has become unmanageable, they may, they usually start slipping in areas of functioning. So going back to children, maybe they're not sleeping. Uh, they may stop eating. Um, and then once, and, and the worry about whatever it is seems out of proportion for what it is that they're they're expressing their worry about. Um, so um, another example, though, is worrying about something that's that they you would think that they shouldn't be worrying about, you know, what if my parents don't really love me? You know, mm -hmm. so there's not this test, or there's not this <clears throat> obvious stressor that they're reacting to, they just have this kind of free floating thoughts that you don't have any idea where this is coming from. Yeah, so good. So it, it kind of, I, I love how you kind of have that as the test that I, syndrome that I could so relate. I, I remember every time that, you know, I'd have to go take a test. I'm like, I, I think any one of us, but I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to do it. But so, but it's one of those that you continue moving past and you get through it. And at the end, if it's like you just deflated a balloon now, it's like, oh my God, that's over with, <laughs> that that's healthy, right? That's normal anxiety that this is part of humanality but if that test is coming and you're getting so worked up that maybe you skip school or you don't sleep the night before and then at the end of it now you're worried did I make a good grade and all mm -hmm. that then that's kind of more of that hey I need to have deal with that a little bit better or and then you use the family analogy because there are you know we see that in our kids especially a blended family not knowing 
you know, they're, they're in new relationships. Their parents are in new relationships and they're like, I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know what this means. I've just been torn between my biological mom and biological dad. And now I'm into a new family dynamic and really trying to figure this out. So I could see where, as you're saying, there's some underlying anxiety that is hard to even call out or even navigate through. And I want to interject something here. Um, you know, another problem though with anxiety is it can be the silent thing that you can't see as a parent, um, because some people may have worries that they're ashamed to talk about, mm. or they may fear that if they say it out loud and put it out into the world, it's going to happen. Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, some people have obsessional thoughts, uh, thoughts that pop into their head. So going back to the, you know, does my, does my dad really love me? Um, they may be too ashamed to even bring that up or not want to think about it because the more they think about it, then the more they think about it. And so yeah. some outward signs of anxiety that's, that someone may be struggling with anxiety are things like noticing chewed fingernails or chewed fingers, hair pulling. Um, and if it's a really young child, um, bed wetting, Things like that can be outward signs that the child is struggling with anxiety and, but they can't articulate what they're experiencing. Love that. Oh, that's great information. Cause that is one of the things that, you know, especially as parents, you know, being where we are today, looking back, we didn't know as parents, when are we entered into a blended family? It's like, you know, we didn't, that wasn't even a, really a thought of how are our kids feeling and if they're not able to express it, then how can we even know or navigate? So having some of those clues of, you know, are they biting their nails, constantly pulling their hair or, or some of these outward signs to be able to notice that and say, wait a minute, you know, is that, are they struggling here? Maybe we need to have some more discussion or create some space to where we can talk about this, try to get some things open. So well, a lot of time, like those things, those symptoms are like things that you want to just, you know, stop biting your nails or, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I know like there's people that put like hot sauce on the kids now <laughs> stuff to like try to stop <laughs> that thing from happening. Or when your kid's bedwetting, I mean, that's because that comes with a whole bunch of challenges as well. And you're trying to solve the bedwetting, but not realizing that that's just an outward sign of what's actually happening um, on the inside. And it's like a clue, like, oh, let's look deeper into this. I think one, another one that may not get picked up on is social anxiety. So social anxiety is one of those things that can really start in the teenage years or tween years, but it can start even lower than that. But it can look like your child not wanting to go here or go to this party and you may just think, well, what's wrong? Why won't you go? Or, um, or think that there's just some other reason when it's really that they're very afraid that people don't, won't like them. Or um, usually with social anxiety, there's a lot of fear about judgment from other people or that they're going to embarrass themselves in front of everyone or, or all these things that they just assume people are thinking about them. And it makes them very uncomfortable and insecure. But when they're young, it's easy to just uh, bulldoze through all of that and make them go to these parties because you need to be social. Your brother is social and, you know, we don't want you to be a loner and so on and so forth. So let's just help help the child by forcing them when yeah. you're not realizing that there's an anxiety behind that that they're really struggling with. Yeah. So, you know, hearing that as a parent, it's like, man, it's like, where's that fine line as or as are they really struggling with something or is this just something that they need to be able to work through to get there? Right. I mean, <laughs> there, there's gotta yeah. be that, that balance, but yeah, not pushing them if there really is a problem. So, so kind of noticing that what anxiety we hear so much in our youth and we hear so much in our kids today about them throwing out the term i'm i'm just anxious you know i've got social anxiety so i can't go we talk hear that to one a lot the yeah anxiety. or i'm depressed you know i'm just depressed you know so we hear that so much why do you think that's such a big issue with kids nowadays i think it's because of the 
exposure to social media, it's become a lot more popular to talk about. Now, that doesn't mean that it's a bigger problem today than it used to be. It's just that we, we're, we're talking about it more. So it's more in people's awareness. Now, the, the a downside of that is it can make people overcall it too much or just or self-diagnose or say, I'm this and that. And they're not really, it's not as much of a problem as they think, but they, they're just, they're labeling, labeling themselves with something they heard on TikTok. Right. But <laughs> despite <laughs> <Not> that, <TikTok. laughs> yes. oh my goodness, I've learned so much from my son about TikTok. Um, yeah. So, I mean, he'll tell me the oddest things like, did you know that blah, blah, blah? And I'll say, what well, did you hear that from TikTok? <laughs> well, yeah, but it's true. And da, da, da. <laughs> But yes. Anyway, um, yes. <laughs> uh, but I do think the net, there's a net gain that the upside is that more people now can feel more comfortable um, talking about how they really feel and what's really going on. And they don't have to feel like an oddball because they are afraid to be away from their parents. So that's, you know, separation anxiety is another thing that uh, can start that starts in childhood. And there's some um, normal developmental stage of that. So kind of going back to how do you know, what's something that you should just try and help them get past versus is this a real problem? Um, you know, children go through a normal developmental stage of not wanting to be separated from their parents. But after a while, it gets to be particularly around the school age, um, it becomes more apparent when it's a problem, when you have a child who's maybe throwing up uh, as you're trying to get them to go to school, like the, the resistance to go to school is just so bad yeah. um, that, you know, it's more than just nerves about the first day of school. Yeah. Oh man, I'm just sitting here just like reliving my kids' childhood, like, oh, <laughs> like, like, oh, okay, that makes, because our kids would get physically sick in situations where they were anxious about something, but also can be very social. So it's very confusing as a parent, how to help them, because you don't want to just be like, okay, well, you can't, you're not going to go to school today. So like, I, that's what I'm just like, what do we do? How do we help in these situations? Like, Okay, so your your kid wakes up, they don't want to go to school, you you know, you know that they're not physically sick, like you know there hasn't been like a stomach bug going around or you're assuming that. You don't just let them stay home. You know it's something about the school and they're they're anxious about going, but how do we find that ground and what do we do about it? Yeah, so that's the million dollar question. Okay. Okay. Oh, I was hoping you had the answer. We were going to just bring enlightenment to everyone right now. We have solved the world's problems. Is. I mean, I guess we could take it down a little bit to like, like knowing their triggers and all of that kind of stuff. But... Right. So I do think though, it can boil down to um, talking to your children to find out what is actually going on because one powerful intervention for um for anxiety for for not just for children even for adults is this technique called affective labeling where you um you attach a word to the emotion that you're experiencing because sometimes we um we can you know have these emotions going on in our head but there's just this vague sense of of just feeling bad, but you don't really know exactly how you're feeling. And that's multiplied 10 times with children who are still learning how to express themselves. So the better you can get at pinpointing what you're experiencing is anger versus sadness versus I feel tense. I feel, um, I feel rejected. You know, all these things, the better you can get at um, being specific about how you feel, the better you are able to cope with how you are feeling when it's just this kind of mishmash of confusion and it just becomes, I feel bad, then you end up with more um, throwing up and bedwetting and, you know, the, the, the emotions get displaced and turn into, and just 
transform into a different way of expressing it. So it's almost like a monster. It's the unknown, especially with kids. They don't know what they're feeling. They just, they're just like, something's not right. I feel bad. I, and it's like, well, okay, help. So really it's being able as a parent to help define what is bad. What What is that emotion? Let's label that emotion. Is it sadness? Is it anger? Are you feeling nervous? Are you, so really being able to label that, that way now you can help them handle or navigate through that so it's really through open communication just talking with your kids more to be able to get down to how they are feeling that kind of you know, take away yeah that's the takeaway okay. so then if you do manhandle them to get them to school yeah. <laughs> when they get home now do a debriefing on mm. how was your day what happened to to get at um, did they experience what they thought they were going to experience? What was their fear about this morning? You might mm -hmm. find out that it's, well, Tommy said, if I show up and don't wear red, that he was going to take my lunch. Well, that's not necessarily an anxiety disorder in your right. child. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's bullying. That's, a, that's bullying. Yeah. yeah. Um, versus... I'd be anxious too. I'd be like, I wouldn't want to go to school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're like, no kids, you're going to school. I don't care if you feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> let him beat you up no um but so versus hearing they don't like their teacher or um I don't know I just thought that people might laugh at me because I didn't do this and then you know so then you can jump in right where your child is to address some of these fears that they have so is that fear that I didn't think that um I don't want people laughing at me well is that because that your child actually did something the day before that would make people laugh? Or is this something blown up in their head because they have social anxiety and they're just excessively worried? Yeah. And you know your child, um, when you hear some of these things, you're the one who can help soothe them and help them learn how to soothe themselves and comfort themselves in these situations. You just but you got to know what the situation is and you got to know what they're worried about. Oh, great advice. Cause that, you know, they're looking to us for comfort. Yeah. We're the safe zone, the safe space. So if we're not being that for them, that's going to cause even more anxiety. I'm sure to where if we're being forceful parents and trying to know you will get through this and toughen up boy, <laughs> you know, as we can <laughs> do, but I love how that approach that you have is like, communicate with them first. If they're having these issues, talk to them, help them label it, help them, you know, figure out, well, what is that emotion? And then once you can pinpoint that, say, okay, well, let's maybe give some pointers of how to overcome that through that experience, whether it's school, whether, you know, what, whatever it is that they're trying to do. And then not just stop there, but debrief at the end. What great advice. Cause as parents, we'll just stop. We're, we're like, man, we got them to do it. Praise the <laughs> Lord. <laughs> you know, and then they go and do it and then they come back and, you know, maybe it was a terrible experience, but, you know, being able to talk to them after that and say, okay, how did it go? You know, and really get their advice and help them navigate through that. You know, were they successful? Were they not? How could they have maybe done things better? What could have created a better experience? And to stay with them through the whole journey of it instead of just trying to get them to push through, but to help them through the entire process. So great advice. Love that. Right. Do you feel like certain kids have triggers like, you know, say something happened in their childhood, you know, we, we learn that a lot of this stuff happens, you know, it's from our childhood that triggers us into our, we're all messed up from our, we're, our we're childhood. All, it's all <laughs> our childhood. <laughs> right. But is it like, if my trigger, like, would it be the same things that, that upset me or caused that anxiety to build up? because of something in my past, whereas his may be something completely different, or is it more like across the board, like that social anxiety and being made fun of? Like, where do you, what do you see with that? Like, is it different per child? Like we have, we learn our child and we learn ourselves and we have to like get in and like do some self-reflecting and figure out what are these triggers that I have? Or is it just like common triggers for everyone? Uh, I would say it's the former that it is, uh, more individual. So it can be 
you know, some people can just be more prone to um, fear on the unknown and uncertainty. And so a person with that kind of temperament can be someone who tends to worry and um, maybe even later on develop generalized anxiety disorder, for example, but not everyone develops disorders, but could be the person who's more prone to something happens. Oh, do I have cancer? And, you know, and start worrying about the, are we going to lose our house now that, you know, uh, that gas is up, things like that. Um, but that said, so that that's one kind of leaning towards uh, a person who can just be uh, more tightly wound and more prone to become anxious easily. But you can also be taught to be anxious and worry right. from over parenting and having your parents teach you that um, you should worry about things that are unknown because they're worrying themselves. And so you learn from your parents, you model that behavior. And so you can grow up in a household where um, you learn to be very fearful. And so in that case, those siblings could all similarly be triggered by um, when something unknown happens or we don't know the future, that means we should worry about it and fret. So if we're, as parents, if we're struggling with anxiety, then that's better chances that we're passing it on to our kids. We're, we're helping instill in them, hey, no, this is that spirit of anxiety, you know, is, is passing on to you. So that puts, as a parent, that self-awareness of, am I, yeah. am I anxious? Do I need to do some self-checks? What, what can I do that way I'm being healthy for, you know, as healthy as I can be right for my kids so that I'm not passing this on or causing them to be more anxious when, you know, they, they don't need to be. Correct. Correct. So, you know, with things the way they are now, say with the economy, um, how much you verbalize matters. So are you mm -hmm. only in your head worried that, um, prices might get too high and you might have to get a second job? Or are you at the dinner table saying, you know, we can't do this anymore because we just don't know what's going to happen. And kids, you, you can't, we can't get you this and that. And, you know, that saying that kind of thing yeah, to, uh, sure. to your children. And that's what they hear. And they learn, uh oh, we're in a horrible time. We may, who knows if we're going to live tomorrow, you know? Yeah. I mean, so that's how um, you can, you know, you can be silently anxious <laughs> and have a bunch of physical problems that no one knows about, like mm -hmm. you're not sleeping and things, or you can be someone who verbalizes your worry. Not everyone verbalizes their worry, but if you do that, then the people around you can just kind of absorb that level of angst. So that's almost a sign of if we're verbalizing our fear or concern, then we do have some type of anxiety that maybe we need to deal with. So that could be that outward sign there is, yeah, I'm saying a lot of negative stuff. <laughs> so maybe I need to, you know, really focus on me for a period and figure out, okay, well, why that way I'm not passing that on. So what, if we're, if, if we understand, okay, I'm feel, I do feel anxious, you know, maybe that, that situation, you know, I'm, I'm calling it out that, man, I'm, I'm just talking a lot of negative stuff and I'm scared that I'm really passing this on to my kids. What are some self-guided uh, solutions, some effective self, self uh, solutions that, you know, maybe uh, I can try before, you know, and if that's not working, then maybe I need to seek counseling or, or therapy or something like that. Are there any self-guided methods out there that we could try to help overcome anxiety? We'll be right back. Check this out. Blended families can be hard at times, can't they? Have you ever said, I don't feel like me and my spouse are connecting, or I'm bending over backwards and my stepkid still pushes me away? Or do you feel like your family's doing okay, but you'd like it to be more than okay? You want your family to level up, take it to an even stronger level. The truth is we're all looking for more joy and happiness in our lives. So how do we start seeing that in our blended family? Because really, our family is the first place we should truly be enjoying and having the most fun with. So how do you enjoy your blended family? You create more fun opportunities that your family loves doing. 
These are big things. They're small things, things that cost money, things that don't cost money. But the more fun you have together, the less blended family drama you'll have, which equals more joy and happiness for everyone. Now, you may be saying, yeah, but I don't know how to do that. I don't even know where to start. That's okay. We walk you through five fun dates you get to have with your family. These dates help you discover those fun things your family loves doing. You'll walk away with so many more great ideas and have an amazing, easy plan to make it happen and to keep it going. Plus, you get to have a lot of fun discovering all this in the process. We walk you through everything and make it really fun and easy. So how do you enjoy your blended family? By going on these five dates and discovering fun in your step family. You'll be so glad you did. Have more fun together and you'll see less problems. The link to get started on this amazing journey is in the show notes of this episode. Sure. Yeah, I'm a big fan of journaling. So, um, and there's different ways you can Mm -hmm. journal and it's essentially, um, you know, the act of taking things that you are worried or ruminating about and getting them out onto paper helps clear your mind to be able to think about other things and be more mindful and be less anxious. So, um, and ruminating is the process of going over and over and over the same thing. Um, so there's different ways that you can, uh, journal. So just an example of one, I'll give two examples. One is, uh, I call it a worry journal where you (laughs) set aside time to write out the things that you have concerns about, and maybe even write some possible solutions to some of these things or some things you can do to, um, solve these problems that you're worried about, assuming it's something that's solvable. And then, um, you, you, you dedicate that time for that. And then you put that aside. And then the next time, uh, let's say the next day, when you start finding yourself wondering, Oh, what if, what if, what if you have to have discipline to say, okay, I'm going to give myself a chance to just let it rip with the worry. And, um, until my designated worry time at the end of the day today, at six, after we eat dinner, et cetera, I'm going to open up my journal and I'm going to write out some of these other things I'm concerned about. One thing that can do that practice or exercise can do for you is help you also put some of your previous worries into perspective. You can find that as you write some of these things down, they become less of the big monster that you thought that they were, or some of them get solved. And so you, you can start to learn that some of these things maybe aren't as dire as you thought. And so you can worry less about them over time, but it also gives you a way to compartmentalize your worry. So that it's not just this kind of free floating stuff. That's all it's in your mind all day long. Yeah. Because you don't want your mind filled with a bunch of fears and worries um, for lots of reasons, but <laughs> you know, that <laughs> ramps up anxiety. It interferes with your, your thinking and problem solving abilities. The other kind of uh, journaling, uh, another kind, there's lots of kinds, is, um, is gratitude journaling. So writing out, um, you could, this could be like a 10 minute exercise of writing out the things that you're thankful for. One thing about of paying attention to the things that you're thankful for, it helps minimize the things that you're worried about. Yeah. We tend to overfocus on the negative and not appreciate what we do have. So when yeah. and so those things when you start seeing collecting, you know, well, I have this and I have that and I have this and I have that you know, this other thing that I might not get, maybe that's not that bad. Cause after all, I have these other things. Yeah. So good. That yeah. I, I'm sitting here taking that in going, what a great way to do that because we are, you know, our brains can just be overwhelmed with, you know, all of us at some point, we just get consumed with worry and concern, especially coming out of the whole COVID season that just ramped up and excelled so many people, all of us, you know, as, as just a, as, as a society in general, but being able to put it all down and cipher through it, that's that man, great advice. Cause that's powerful to be able to sit there and do it. And then you can determine 
you know, is that even worth worrying about? Or as you're writing it, you're like, why am I even worried about that? That was mm -hmm. dumb. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. <laughs> and calling it out for what it is, but maybe you're finding something that really is something that you're struggling with that maybe you need to dive deeper in that area to help unpack or overcome that. So, and we're such advocates of gratitude journal mm -hmm. that that's, you know, that is so powerful within itself because it, yeah. we, it really does. It does something in your psyche. It does something in your spirit that just really, it gets you focusing on the positive instead of the negative. And the more we're mm -hmm. focused on the positive, the less we can focus on the negative. So it really yeah. does. It does that whole shift right there. So good. Yeah. Like, as you were saying, it's like, okay, yeah, I didn't even realize that's, that's what I was doing. Like when I write down all the things that are going on in my head, most of them are things that I'm, you know, worried about or to-do list type things and trying to come up with solutions if I can. And if I can't, then that's when I, you know, as people of faith that we pray about those things that are out of our control. And then I'm like, Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm doing what you're saying is, <laughs> is the right thing. Is there stuff like for different ages or finding things that work for, for one personality or for one age, one type of kid versus other, like, is it sort of like the question I asked earlier about is like a blanket thing. I know like in the book, you talk about like coloring is one one of those methods or like going for a walk and stuff, there's different techniques. Do you have to find what works for you and your personality? Yes, because not everyone, not everything works for everyone in every situation. Um, I know speaking personally, as great as coloring is, I just can't do it. Yeah, um, well, when I saw that, I was like, no, coloring, because I pushed down real hard. <laughs> <laughs> I would be sitting there thinking, how long is this going to take me? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> with the, the mandalas and all those complicated designs, but you know, it's great for, for a lot of people. I have patients who love coloring. Um, so yeah, you do have to find what works for you. Children, um, you know, um, with uh, mental health and psychology, psychiatry, there's a difference between child and adolescent. And some, some people draw the line at different places. I think in general, like young child would be like eight years old, somewhere around there up until like maybe 12, the tween years, preteen years. And then the teen years would be adolescence. Um, and then some people argue, I, I'm a believer that adolescence probably goes up until like 25, you know, through yeah. the college years. <laughs> Um, and then there's really young children under eight with really young children, um, who have more difficulty with abstract thinking and, and drawing conclusions and things like that and seeing cause and effect, um, therapists will do a lot of, um, play therapy and, and drawing and coloring and things like that. Um, I don't do, I don't treat children, so I don't know all the details of that, but they use those types of uh, methods. Once a child gets a little older, eight and above, that still the, the cognitive exercises, some of the ones I talk about in the book, um, are a little bit different for them. But still, I think that a child could benefit from grounding exercises. Um, an example of one would be um, naming all the colors in a room. This is the kind of thing that helps bring, um, it, it is kind of, it is really a mindfulness exercise of taking you out of the moment of thinking this and that and worrying and your mind, mind swirling about this and that and the other, and bringing your awareness to something neutral. So a color awareness exercise could be taking a moment to pick a color and name and name all of the things in the room that are that color. So I've got a blue shirt and I've got a blue cup here in my room and anything else blue, oh, a blue book, that kind of thing. That um, is something that would be great for a child maybe who's um, having a meltdown, mm -hmm. uh, just the regular end of the day meltdown yeah. <laughs> um, of helping them calm because they're now you're distracting them from the, they're, they're upset about this and that and the other to focusing in on this thing that's easy to do, just recognize, well, all the blue things in the room kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so 
that's that color and awareness exercise is a grounding exercise that adults can use, children can use. But I do think um, with children, um, the the grounding exercises probably are a good way to start for uh, lowering, uh, turning down the dial on upset and distress. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. And I love the book because in, in the book, you do have a lot of exercises and different things to be able to help <clears throat> manage, navigate, to try, attempt to really overcome a lot of yeah. the anxiety that we can face in ourselves or for our kids. So I, I love how you put that out and everything. So if we're trying to do some of this self uh, guided things to try to help overcome that anxiety and we're, you know, for ourselves or for our kids. And really, we're just not seeing us getting better. Or our kids getting better. Is that when really looking for, um, uh, help going, going and getting counseling therapy, things of that nature? Yes. So, um, when do you get, when do you seek professional help. And I would say some of the signs that someone should seek professional help is when things are, when they're not able to kind of keep up with their normal daily functions. Mm -hmm. So an adult, um, you're not, you're, you're not sleeping and it's starting to interfere with your ability to maybe show up work, show up for work on time, or it's starting to affect your thinking. You can't, um, focus and things at work because you're got, not getting enough sleep. Um, you are falling down on, on general responsibilities because you're forgetting things because you're all out of sorts all the time. Um, with children, they may not be keeping up with their schoolwork. They may uh, be getting to the point where, where um, they're not eating because they're they're always so in distress. If you've got the person who like gets upset and can't eat, get, has a stomach ache all the time, maybe even throwing up, um, that's now you're getting into the realm where it's becoming unmanageable and it's interfering with daily life activities. And that's when someone should seek professional help you could start with a therapist. You could even start uh, with your pediatrician at oh. first. Yeah, I was going to ask that first. Do you go to your pediatrician and then they recommend yeah. or just yeah. see what they say? You could, you could see what the pediatrician says. Um, and, you know, and the pediatrician could make sure that there's not something uh, physical that they think may be the cause because uh, probably the pediatrician is not going to do therapy. They would <laughs> right. be prescribing something. So if you're not wanting to like explore medication, and I don't know that, uh, you know, any pediatricians that would necessarily prescribe medication for anxiety in a young child, you know, maybe a teenager, um, then that pediatrician could also could maybe recommend a therapist if they can't then, you know, there are sites like psychology today, where uh, lots of great people have their practices listed. Uh, it's important that when you see a counselor or therapist, that person has to have a license in the state where you live. Mm, so nice. something like psychology today, you can search by zip code. Oh, good stuff. Yeah. We, man, I'm, I'm telling you that we're walking away from this going, wow. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I just have so many questions, but <laughs> like, um... well, we thank you so much for being here. We're so excited about this book. Where, where can our listeners get this book? Cause it is hot off the press ready. Why am I so anxious? Where, where can they get this? They can find it pretty much wherever books are sold, but certainly Amazon, Barnes and Noble, bookstore.org, um, lots of places that you can order the book. Love that. And I do want to just say like what we did here is just scratching the surface, like very minimal of anxiety and how to dig into it. And Dr. Tracy goes into so much detail at the beginning of the book to set up the stage and the, the science behind it and the whys behind it and like different personalities and all of that kind of stuff on like what causes the anxiety in us and then it goes into like finding triggers and then like the whole second half of the book is all of these different ways to help with anxiety and then you give like the like the 
the recommendations, like different types of things. And then like your opinion, you know, little snippets in there as well. I like, but there's so much, like, I wanted to just ask for you to share all of them with us. There were so <laughs> many, so many different things. And so it is so valuable to get the book and be able to read through that and then try things, you know, like how we were saying, just see if this works with your kid or if this works with you. And if that doesn't, even with a counselor, and if this counselor doesn't work, then finding another. And your book just goes into such great detail on those things. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. It's almost unfair to have a discussion because it is just scratching the surface. We, like, we can't talk about everything uh, in right. just one of these kind of discussions. It definitely was a lot denser than I expected it to be. But it, so it, you know, you can, some people can kind of think of it as like an encyclopedia resource. I mean, that sounds boring. I hate to call it that, but um, our kids but are like, can, what, what's that encyclopedia? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is it even an encyclopedia these days? But I think of it as like a manual to have on hand. And my hope with it was that people could look at all of the different tools and things that I talk about. There's bunches, as you said, and figure out what works for you because not everything works for everyone. And that said, even in the appendix, I have a section on what works for what. So what is supposed to work for a panic attack? If you have one, what's supposed to work if you're worrying and so on and so forth. Um, and so, and then you can look at those tools try them and I explain how to do them and then see which ones work for you so that when things happen for the person who has occasional anxiety that just comes and goes and ebbs and flows, you can pull from those tools when you need them. Yes. And it, it really is. When I looked at the appendixes in the back, I'm like, man, this is, you have a lot of stuff there. So it really is such, such a great tool, such a great resource. So listeners, you got to get this book. You know, this is such it, so well thought out, laid out. So we appreciate it, Dr. Tracy. And you are big on YouTube. So you give little nuggets. It looks like weekly that you push out. Are you anywhere else social media wise that are follow that our listeners could follow you? I am. I'm on Instagram and I'm on TikTok as well. All right. <laughs> um, I'm not dancing on TikTok, but no? I'm on oh, TikTok. Okay. <laughs> uh, I can dance though, but. And, and, <laughs> Please, I love how you had to throw that one in. I can't dance. Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm I'm on, on TikTok and Instagram and we can't dance. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but you can find me. My handle is the same on all three. Okay. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, it's Dr. Tracy Marks, D-R, and then Tracy, T-R-A-C-E-Y, Marks. Perfect. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for being here. We appreciate it so yeah. much. Thank you. Thanks <laughs> Thanks for having me here. And enjoying your blended family, all my B-fams out there, I know you're walking away from this going, whoa, because anxiety is real, right? It's something that we all deal with on some level or, you know, some type of level, we've all struggled with that. But being able to help identify that within ourselves and being able to help identify that within our kids is big. You know, being able to open up that line of communication with our kids, especially in a blended family through all the struggles, the challenges that we can have coming in with co-parenting, just the whole different dynamics in your family from the way it was before. Our kids are struggling with things that they don't even know what they're dealing with. And so being able to help keep that line of communication open and help them work through that any anxiety they might have is big. But not just that, but helping to decipher at the end, you know, maybe it's a, a challenge or an event that they're going through that you're helping get them to that, but helping to debrief at the end is so powerful. And then trying some of these techniques to help just really to be there for them and to be there for us, right? Because if we're not dealing with ourselves, we're more apt to pass that on to our kids. Yeah, so I think that was the thing that I was seeing is, is we're we have so much that we're going through in our blended family as well. And those things we may not even realize, like yeah. we learned today that we're passing on. So Yeah, so definitely this helps us just to be able to have more tools, more knowledge to go out there and call it out and not let this become a, a crutch in our lives, right? Yeah. To be free from this and, and to find more joy and happiness and to be able to pass that and spread that to our families. So listen, go get this book. 
this is a powerful book. It is hot off the press. Go get it. We'll put all the links in the show notes. That way you have easy access. But we love you, and we thank you for tuning in, and y'all go be blessed. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks for joining us today. We hope this episode has been a blessing and encouraged your family journey. Make sure you stay connected with us and join our weekly blended family newsletter. We send an email out every Friday morning full of support and encouragement. And when you join, we also want to give you a free gift. So go get yours today. The link is in the show notes below. Have an amazing day. Remember to enjoy the journey with your blended family. And we'll see you on the next episode.